So, so good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Beatriz Nava. I'm the Consul for Culture Affairs, for Cultural Affairs at the Consulate General of Mexico. And it is my, my pleasure to introduce this uh, session, the Silver Way, Travel Writing Across the Pacific of the 16th to 19th centuries. Uh, it is, uh, this is an event uh, organized by the Consulate General of Spain, but of course, uh, it is, it's, uh, since it's subject matter, it's uh, so important and relevant to all Latin American countries uh, and the Philippines represented here in, uh, in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. It, uh, it is our pleasure to, to support uh, the event. And um, of course, this, uh, this event will uh, uh, revolves around uh, the, the book uh, the Silver Way, China, Spanish America, and the Birth of Globalization, 1565-1815, uh, written by Peter Gordon and uh, Juan Jose Morales, which uh, revisit uh, maybe a forgotten story on the 16th to 19th century uh, Silver Way, which is the Trans-Pacific successor of the Silk Road, uh, and which brings uh, most interesting parallels uh, to, and thought-provoking discussions with today's uh, global economic scene and of course uh, sheds light to many to the many cultural ties uh, between uh, Asia and uh, and Latin America uh, it is my my pleasure also to acknowledge uh, the presence of some of the old colleagues from the diplomatic corps uh, for instance uh, mr. Damian Martinez Tagueña consul general of Mexico uh, Ms. Uh, Diana Catalina Davila Suarez, Acting Consul General of Colombia, and Mr. Roderico Atienza, Deputy Consul General of the Philippines. Uh, of course, Peter Gordon and Juan Jose Morales do not need uh, an introduction, but I do it nevertheless uh, with great uh, pleasure. Peter Gordon is the editor of the Asian Review of Books. It's publisher at Chameleon Press, co-founder of e-commerce firm Paddyfield.com, and a regular contributor to such periodicals as, like as the South China Morning Post, uh, Kaixin, and The Diplomat. He was instrumental in the development of both the Hong Kong uh, International Literary Festival and the Man Asian Literary Prize. While Juan Jose Morales is a former president of the Spanish Chamber of, the Hong, uh, Spanish Chamber of Hong Kong, Commerce of, Chong of Hong Kong, uh, and well-known as a writer and speaker on Asian and Iber Iberian history, arts, and culture. He has a Master of International and Public Affairs from the University of Hong Kong, and has also studied international relations at the Peking University. His writing has appeared in Kaixin, The Diplomat, and the Jakarta Globe, among others. Uh, Mr. Juan Jose Morales uh, will give a presentation on uh, some of the book premises while Mr. Peter Gordon will invest in the reading of several travel descriptions from the 17th century. I'm sure this will be a, a most interesting session. So for that, without further ado, I give the floor to Peter Gordon and Juan Jose Morales. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Beatrice, for that very kind introduction. I'm not going to give much of a preamble. What we're going to do uh, is that Juan is going to run through the historical background, which I'm sure you'll find interesting. We have lots of pretty pictures. It would be very nice. And in the middle of that, well, as we were, we were doing the book, of course, we went to many primary sources. These were um, things that people wrote at the time and a lot of them were travel writing. But in the book, because it's a short book, we could only take a line or two. So what we did for today is we went back and we've taken uh, the much, much longer passages. Um, and, I, and I think it's interesting. These are people that actually lived at the time, that were writing at the time, and the, the kind of um, message I would give is that travel writing is not something that was invented 50 years ago. Uh, it, was going on, well, Marco Polo, of course, is the best example of a travel writer, and he lived 700 years ago. But the, there, there was travel writing uh, in this region four to 500 years ago, and that, uh, generally speaking, it wasn't done by people that wrote in English. It was by people that wrote in Spanish and other languages. So, Juan? Buenas 
Well, thank you very much for coming. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, nice meeting you all. We are going to talk about a topic that is surprisingly little known or completely forgotten. And our topic uh, intersects the age of exploration, the history of navigation, the first encounter between China and the West, and monetary history. And our story starts in the Pacific, and with two protagonists coming from the Iberian Peninsula, Miguel López de Legazpi and Andrés de Urdaneta. El, the Spanish have crossed the Pacific already from 1519 under the command of Magellan. It was the first Western crossing uh, of the Pacific and arrives to the Philippines. The, uh, the objective was actually to come back with the spices, but Magellan was killed and uh, only uh, two ships uh, survived, the Trinidad that went farther north, but then realized that, uh, please, yeah, you can take seat yeah, on the front if you like, no problem. Ah, muchas gracias. And so there were finally f several attempts by the Spanish to cross the Pacific and then come back. There were, f uh, they could make it from the American coast to Asia, to the Moluccas and the Philippines, but they tried and they couldn't for several reasons. Doldrums, seasonal weather, uh, simply uh, the impossibility, the lack of um, uh, supplies, uh, storms, so they all failed. Except in 1565, uh, this expedition succeeded in coming back. So it was uh, what, uh, what we call in Spanish el torna viaje, so the way back. They uh, sailed from Mexico and they arrived in the Philippines. Finally, uh, under the command of uh, Lopez de Legazpi, they settled uh, in, in the Philippines and they, you can say, conquered the Philippines, but it was a, in a peaceful way, more or less. And, and Andres de Urdaneta could come back, and it took uh, well a very long journey. And the important matter, not only he learned how to come back, he knew how to come back, but he charted the way. This route that he charted uh, was to become the Manila Galleon, or now the China, the China ship. So that it was finally the longest lasting shipping line in history. And why the Europeans came to Asia? In the first place, uh, the Portuguese. It was no for China, it was for spices. In the 16th century, the most profitable trade in the world. The Portuguese did settle in the Moluccas, so that is the origin of uh, most, uh, and the most expensive spices, and also in Ceylon. And, but China was not really the important, was an accident, the next encounter with them. But what the Europeans found uh, of course, this trade or this encounter didn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, uh, trade in South Asia and all over Asia was going out uh, for centuries, if not for millennia. And at this time, in the 16th century, was at a very high point. So there were very uh, busy trade between China and Southeast Asia, Southeast Asia and India and so on. And in fact, the Philippines was already a trading hub in this area, so the Spanish would take this opportunity uh, meeting them. So you see, um, unfortunately, there has some technical problems. We have tried several presentations that I brought, but uh, the, the quality is not good. If afterwards you are very interested, please give me your email, and I will send you more information, and even the, the presentation if you like. And so this map is, made in Amsterdam by Dutch, but by Dutch spies that took the information in Lisbon. And in Lisbon, this information by Bartolomeo Lasso was of Portuguese sources and Spanish sources. 
So this map is uh, one of the uh, is in the 1590s, and so here appears discoveries made by the Portuguese and the Spanish. So although the Spanish have, so to speak, failed in several expeditions in trying to find a way back, so they could come, as I said from the beginning, from America to Asia, and only uh, Andres de Urdaneta was the only one, uh, the first one to make the way back, so it was one of the most important navigational feats uh, of any age, so just comparable to the trip of uh, the voyage of Columbus or the voyage of Magellan. Uh, you see in this map also represented the spices, that was the, uh, the reason why they came here, but so many discoveries made by the Spanish. Uh, New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, the Mariana Islands, uh, the Palaus, Marquesas, Marshall. So the Spanish map the Pacific. Finally, they miss Hawaii, by the way. But they were also instrumental in the later discovery of Australia by Cook, as someone interested, if you want, you can ask me later. So uh, this is uh, the scene that it, it sets our story. But why the Spanish came through the Pacific, that is, after all, almost half the hemisphere, is the largest huge uh, ocean in, in the world. Well, both the Portuguese and the Spanish, the two Iberian nations, they s start the age of discovery. And then they decide to separate the world with an imaginary meridian that it will cut the two sides, signed in 1494 by the kings of Spain and Portugal. And so they will say from this, part uh, to the east uh, belongs to the Portuguese, this part belongs to the Spanish, so all the Americas, and you see finally this will become Brazil, that I think the, the consul of Brazil was about to come, but he's not here now. And it was later on in the Treaty of Zaragoza that they settled also the meridian uh, in, in the Pacific, and obviously, uh, well, the, the Philippines would belong, so to speak, to the Portuguese. This uh, we got from the uh, archive Archivo de Indias in Sevilla, in Spain, which is one of the, multi import, one of the most important archives in the world. Both the building and the contents are uh, declared World Heritage Site. Here, this is the document uh, of this treaty. The Portuguese version that is kept in the Spanish archive, the Spanish version is kept in the Portuguese archive. And perhaps if uh, Spain is well known for uh, the cultural heritage, but the most important is not the architecture or the paintings or the sculptures, but actually the documents, the archives. And here a very important and even moving document, which is uh, the king of Spain, all-powerful Philip II, that has the largest empire that uh, the world has ever seen, writes directly to Andres de Urdaneta. Andres de Urdaneta was a navigator that uh, shipwrecked in the Moluccas with all those early Spanish expeditions, but after eight years of standoff with the Portuguese, he was taken under custody to Spain through the routes that the Portuguese take, that the Portuguese, as we have explained uh, before, they, yes, they could, take, they could go through the Cape of Good Hope, through Africa. And Urdaneta was a great navigator and geographer, and he could, uh, and, and also in, in, this, in this trip, in, in his, uh, when he is, uh, was shipwrecked in the Moluccas with uh, eight months of uh, eight older men, he plot the possible routes uh, back. When the Philip II writes to Urdaneta, Urdaneta was already a very old man, in the late 50s, uh, early 60s, and he was uh, already a friar. He has took orders, and he was a friar of the Order of San Agustin. And here, although well, it's hard to read here, they said, uh, devote uh, Father Urdaneta, I know that you are, uh, that you know the seas, and please help with this expedition. Yes, to try again and go uh, uh, to Asia and uh, finally to come back, that he did in 1565, so he starts our story. This route, as I said, it was uh, the base for what is called the Manila Galleon, or uh, is the 
trading route or the shipping line between uh, Mexico, or what's called New Spain, Nueva España, that is uh, all what is called Central America, uh, Mexico, and all the south and southwest of the current uh, United States. And uh, he, uh, the, somehow the, the trip or the voyage in this direction was more or less, of course, nothing was smooth sailing, uh, but it could be very fast, like 45 days from Acapulco to Manila, where the Spanish finally settled in 1571. And however, the trip back, because of the currents and the, and the winds, could take five to six months. So you can imagine the hardships of this trade. This is part of the largest uh, Spanish trading routes, which is uh, in, with base in Manila to Acapulco. From Acapulco, the, the goods will go to the Mexico as a central market, or Veracruz, crossing the uh, Isthmus of Central America, and it was actually called El Camino de China, the China Road. And then uh, the, 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 the goods uh, of, from all uh, America will consolidate in Havana and from Havana to, to Seville. And of, of course, we are in the mercantilist, mer mercantilist time, so these are in the regime was uh, in, in the regime of monopoly. But remember that the, East, uh, the English East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, the French East India Company were all monopolies until the 19th century. And the ship and f uh, there was mainly only one ship that will cross the, the Pacific in each direction each year. It was one of the uh, largest ships in the age of sailing. It could take at least 500 tons, but even 1,000, even 2,000 tons. So it, they were the largest ship in the age of sail. It, it could load, of course, a lot of merchandise. There is a reading that Peter uh, uh, can, can read from this time to describe the hardships of the trip. Oh. <clears throat> um, this is a, this like all the readings is pretty old. This is from 1699. Now, these are all taken from the original books. Uh, this is from a very old translation from the first part of the, eight, of the 18th century. So the English is a bit strange. It's a bit hard for me to read because they didn't like U's, they used V's instead. And double L's and spell things in a funny way. I'll, I'll do my best. <clears throat> but we decided not to change the language, but to leave it the way it was, to try to give you some flavor of the time. So I'm going to read it uh, slowly. Right? This is from a gentleman called Gemelli Careri, who was an Italian, who wrote a book, a very long book. It was about six volumes called Giro del Mondo, which means trip around the world, in 1699. Uh, and one of the legs of the trip was to go on the Manila Galleon, on these boats as Juan just described, from Manila to Acapulco. So I'm going to read part of that chapter. And the chapter, the heading of the chapter is The Author's Tedious and Dreadful Voyage to the Port of Acapulco. So that will give you an idea of the flavor of the piece. There is no doubt, he writes, but this voyage has always been dangerous and dreadful. In 1575, the ship Espiritu Santo, or the Holy Ghost, was cast away at Cataduanes through the ignorance of the pilot who could not find the embocadero, or mouth of the strait. In 1596, the contrary winds drove the St. Philip as far as Japan, where it was taken by way of reprisal with all the lading, all the goods, designed from New Spain. In 1602, two other galleons were cast away and others after that. The poor people stowed in the cabins of the galleon bound toward the land of promise of New Spain endure no less hardship than the children of Israel did when they went from Egypt towards Palestine. There is hunger, thirst, sickness, cold, continual watching, and other sufferings. Besides the terrible shocks of from side to side caused by the furious beating of the waves. 
I may further say that they endure all the plagues God sent upon Pharaoh to soften his hard heart. For if he was infected with leprosy, the galleon is never clear of a universal raging itch as an addition to other miseries. If the air was then filled with gnats, the ship swarms with little vermin that the Spaniards, that the Spaniards called gorgojos, which are bred in the biscuits, so swift that they in a short time not only run over cabins, beds, and the very dishes the men eat on, but insensibly fasten upon the body. Instead of locusts, there are several other sorts of vermin of sundry colors that suck the blood. Abundance of flies fall into the dishes of broth, in which there also swim worms of several sorts. At noon, we have mongos, which are something like kidney beans, in which there were so many maggots that they swam at the top of the broth. This bitter fare was sweetened after dinner with a little water and sugar, yet the allowance was but a small cocoa shell full, which in rather increased than quenched our thirst. Yet they never fail of sweetmeats at table, chocolate twice a day, of which the sailors and grummets make as great a consumption as the riches. Notwithstanding the dreadful sufferings in this prodigious voyage, yet the desire of gain prevails with many to venture through it four, six, and sometimes ten times. The very sailors, though they forswear the voyage when out at sea, yet when they come to Acapulco, for the lucre of 275 pieces of eight, the king, which the king allows them for their return, they never remember their sufferings, like women after giving birth. The whole pay is 350, I should say there, there's a lot in here which isn't really politically correct, so I'll just leave it in, I'm not editing anything. It was written a long time ago. The whole pay is 350 pieces of eight, but they only have 75 paid them at Cavite, for they are bound for America, when they are bound for America. For if they had half, very few would return to the Philippine Islands for the rest. The merchants, there is no doubt, get by this voyage 150 or 200 percent profit, and indeed it is a great satisfaction to return home in less than a year with 17 or 18,000 pieces of eight clear gains a sum that, make a, that may make a man easy as long as he lives. The extraordinary gains induce many to expose themselves to so many dangers and miseries. For my own part, these or greater hopes shall not prevail with me to undertake the voyage again, which is enough to destroy a man or make him unfit for anything else as long as he lives. Thank you. And here, uh, an, another representation of, of the galleon Sailors were almost always Filipinos. These ships were made in the shipyards of Cavite, near Manila, in the Philippines. And it was made with uh, wood from the Philippines. If you are, uh, if you like the furniture of boats, so it was even of the most expensive uh, uh, boats, like thick and even molave. So, and it was so good that it was almost impervious to cannon fire and to ship rock. And here another representation actually painted by Chinese and is describing the Manila Galleon but in the Mariana Islands, with the uh, inhabitants of, of the Mariana Islands. Why I pronounce several times China in the Chinese when this trip, this voyage, this trading route somehow is between Manila and Acapulco. Well, this is one part of the leg and step by step, you will understand uh, the full story. Because the other part of the story is made by the Chinese themselves. And here, the first Western representation of a Chinese junk, a Chinese ship. When the Spanish arrived in the Philippines and in Manila in particular, and they conquered Manila and they settled in Manila in 1571, there were already Chinese coming for trade, very few. In the moment the Spanish settled there, the Chinese came en mass. So they came by the thousands and thousands and thousands setting in Manila. So much so that Manila became the most sinicized city outside China. Even perhaps today it is. So the Minanghua dialects of southern China, the Fujian province, are still widely spoken and kept by generations and generations. And of course they have mixed with the local population as well. 
and they will go always from the ports of Fujian province uh, to Manila. The Spanish finally didn't settle in China, in the China coast, only very briefly, but because of the Portuguese hostility, finally they left. And it was convenient for the Spanish to keep Manila as a trading hub, in the same way that Hong Kong has been and still is the most important trading hub perhaps in Asia. Manila was for several centuries this trading hub. And uh, both the Filipinos and the Chinese were the protagonist. And I think uh, I'm going to, to speak also briefly about the two places. Uh, one is uh, Manila. Without Manila, nothing uh, of this story could have happened. And El Parian de Manila. Parian is a Tagalog word that means market, but it was the place where the Chinese settled, somehow where it was the China market. So the, Ch the Chinese will bring, will bring the goods from China, mainly silks, porcelain, furniture, ivory, fans, and mainly luxury goods. We are talking about a trade of luxury goods, mainly for the affluent societies in, in Spanish America. But if you pay attention to this, this print, you will see that there are people from all over the world in this Parian. So there are Chinese, of course, there are Filipinos, of course, uh, but there are also Armenians, there are Parsi, there are Westerners in this, in this Parian. And it's interesting uh, to know in, f in the first person some stories from these entrepreneurial people. Okay, I have, there are two. Uh, the first one uh, is from Fray Domingo, who was Bishop of the Philippines who wrote back to Spain in 1590. He said, what has pleased us all here has been the arrival of a bookbinder from Mexico. He brought books with him, set up a bindery, and hired a sangle, that was the word they used for Chinese people, uh, who had offered his services to him. The sangle secretly, and without his master noticing it, watched how the latter bound books, and lo, in no less than a few, few weeks, he left the house saying that he wished to serve him no longer and set up a similar shop. I assure your majesty that he became so excellent a workman that his master has been forced to give up the business because the sangle has drawn all the trade. His work is so good that there is no need of Spanish tradesmen. At the time I am writing, I have in my hand a Latin version of Navarro bound by him, and in my judgment, it could not be better bound even in Sevilla. So. Even in 1590, Chinese immigrants were causing disruption in local labor markets. The next one uh, is also from the Philippines, is from Juan Diego de Bobadilla in 1640. And this is about the uh, entrepreneurial uh, abilities of the Chinese merchants. Again, it was a letter written from Manila back to Spain. The, those Chinese merchants are so keen after gain that if one sort of merchandise has succeeded well one year, they take a great deal of it the following year. A Spaniard who had lost his nose through a certain illness sent for a Chinese to make him one of wood uh, in order to hide the deformity. The workman made him so good a nose that the Spaniard in great delight paid him munificently, giving him 20 escudos. The Chinese, attracted by the ease with which he had made that gain, laid it a fine boatload of wooden noses the following year and returned to Manila but he found himself very far from his hopes and quite left out in the cold. For in order to have a sale for that new merchandise, he found he would have to cut off the noses of all Spaniards in the country. <laughs> Thank you. And we got the other side uh, of the trading line, Acapulco, was uh, together with San Francisco, today is the, most imp the best natural port in the uh, western coast of all the American continent. But Acapulco was not truly a city. It was a market town, uh, only set when the, uh, the galleon came. And from Acapulco, as I said, so the goods will go to Mexico or will go to Veracruz. There is a story, I think, about Acapulco. Yes. We well, there, there were two, but you wouldn't let me read one. Or, or where you like. Because... <laughs> because uh, our friend uh, Giamatti Carreri, the Italian, arrived in Acapulco and was not very complimentary about it. 
<laughs> so we need to he know. said it was <laughs> said it looks more like a village than a port, and the houses are all made of mud. So he wasn't very happy with it. So we we would we wouldn't read that one. But I'm going to read one by Alexander von Humboldt, uh, who was a very famous German, I think, naturalist, who sailed up and down the coast of Latin America. This is from right at the end of the period. This is from 1814. Uh, and this is what he, where this, uh, but the, when the Manila Galleon was just about ending, but still going on. And this is what he writes. The oldest and most important branch of commerce of Acapulco is the exchange of merchandise of the East Indies and China for the precious metals of Mexico. The commerce limited to a single galleon is extremely simple. And though I have been on the spot where the most renowned fair of the world is held, I can add little information to that which has already been given by others. The galleon, which is generally from 12 to 1,500 tons, is commanded by an officer of the Royal Navy, sails from Manila in the middle of July or the beginning of August when the southwest monsoon is completely established. Its cargo consists in muslins, printed calicoes, coarse cotton shirts, raw silks, Chinese silk stockings, jewelries from Canton or Manila by Chinese artists, spices, and aromatics. The voyage is carried out on either by the Straits of St. Of Bernardine or Capo Bajados, which is in the northernmost part of the island of Luzon. It formerly lasted from five to six months, but since the art of navigation has been improved, the passage from Manila to Acapulco is only three to four months. Winds from the northwest and southwest prevail in the great ocean, as well as generally in all seas beyond the natural limits of the trade winds to the north and south of parallels of 28 and 30 degrees, opposite in their direction to the trade wind, which may be considered as atmospherical countercurrents. Formerly, the galleon ascended as high as 35 degrees of north latitude to work for the high mountains of St. Lucia in California, which rise to the east of the channel of Santa Barbara. But within the last 20 years, they have kept much farther south. For after falling in with the island of Guadalupe, the pilot steers southeast and avoiding the dangers of the shoal Colabri Ojos, which means open your eyes, and the two Farallon of the, of the Alicios. It is very convenient circumstance that in all this long passage, the galleon finds not a single point of shelter from Manila to the island of Guadalupe and the coast of California. It is a pity that to the north of the, Sa of the Sandwich Islands, which are Hawaii, no other archipelago has been discovered, which situated between the old and the new continent might have afforded refreshments and a good anchorage. Whenever the news arrive at Mexico that the galleon has been seen off the coast, the roads of Chilpasingo and Acapulco are covered with travelers, and every merchant hastens to be the first to treat with the supercargoes who arrive from Manila. In general, a few powerful houses of Mexico join together for the purpose of purchasing goods, and it has happened that the cargo has been sold before the news of the arrival of the galleon were known at Veracruz. This purchase is often made without opening the bales, and although at Acapulco the merchants of Manila are accused of what is called trampas de China, or Chinese fraud, it must be allowed that the commerce between two countries at the distance of 3,000 leagues from each other is carried on perhaps with more honesty than the trade between some nations of civilized Europe who have never had any connection with Chinese merchants. While the merchandises of the East Indies are transported from Acapulco to the capital of Mexico to be distributed throughout the Kingdom of New Spain, the bars of iron and silver coins intended for the return cargo return from the interior, from the interior to the coast. The galleon generally departs in the month of February or March, and it goes then nearly with ballast, for the lading in the journey from Acapulco to, Mexico, uh, to Manila consists only of silver, a very small quantity of cochineal of Oaxaca, cocoa of Guayaquil, and Caracas wine, oil, and Spanish wool. The quantity of precious metals exported to the Philippine Islands, including what is not registered, amounts in general to a million, and frequently to 1,300,000 piastres. A piaster was, there were about um, uh, three, to the, three to the pound, the British pound. Uh, the number of passengers changes in general very considerably and augmented from time to time by colonies of monks sent by Spain and Mexico to the Philippine Islands. The galleon of 1804 carried out 75 monks, which gave occasion to the Mexicans saying that the Nao de China, which was their name for the Manila galleon, loaded in return with plata y frailes, with silver and monks. And this uh, trade of mainly luxury goods from uh, China and Asia in general, because also ships from Southeast Asia and India came to Manila, to America, they would flow to 
so all uh, the, the capitals and important towns and villages of America, so uh, from Colombia, Peru, uh, Chile, and all Central America. But there, and also part of the goods also to the Iberian Peninsula, to Spain. But there was, there was a, a city that we must single out for the importance. It was Mexico City. It was one of the largest uh, cities in the world. It was a very sophisticated city. It was, you can say, the most uh, uh, cosmopolitan, uh, multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic uh, city in the world. They have also, uh, it was very sophisticated. They have universities. They have a printing press from the 1530s. Uh, they have writers, uh, philosophers. And they have a Chinese market. And it was in the main uh, square, that is, was Zócalo. If you have been in Mexico City, this beautiful and very large square, if you see within this uh, Zócalo or the main square in Mexico City, there is a part with red uh, tiles, uh, red roofs. This was the Chinese market. And there is uh, another painting of this time, of the 17th century, unfortunately, it's not, not very good, but this, you can see also this Chinese market. So you can say it's the first uh, Chinatown uh, in, uh, in, in the Western world, so outside Asia. And there are stories also from Mexico. Peter? This is, uh, I was looking up where the author was from because I forgot. Uh, it's by a gentleman called Thomas Gage, who I believe was Irish. Uh, and he was a priest. Uh, which you can probably realize when you listen to what he says. He went to Mexico in 16, he was traveling around the West Indies, uh, and he went to Mexico in 1640, and he wrote about it, uh, and um, he didn't like what he saw. It is a byword that at Mexico there are four things fair, that is to say, the women, the apparel, the horses, and the streets. But to this I may add the beauty of some of the coaches of the gentry, which do exceed in cost the best of the court of Madrid and other parts of Christendom. For there they spare no silver, no gold, nor precious stones, nor cloth of gold, nor the best silks from China to enrich them. Add to the gallantry of their horses, the pride of some doth add the cost of bridles and shoes of silver. The streets are very broad. In the narrowest, narrowest of them, three coaches may go, and in the broader, six may go in the breadth of them which makes the city seem a great deal bigger than it is. In my time, it was thought to be of between 30 and 40,000 inhabitants, Spaniards, who were so proud and rich that half the city was judged to keep coaches, for it was a most credible report that in Mexico in my time there were, there were more than 15,000 coaches. The streets of Christendom must not compare with those in breadth and channels, but especially in the riches of the shops which do adorn them. Above all, the goldsmith shops and works are to, are to be admired. The Indians and the people of China that have been made Christians and every year come thither have perfected the Spaniards in that trade. The viceroy that went thither the year 1625 caused a popinjay to be made of silver, gold, and precious stones with the perfect colors of the popinjay's feathers, a bird bigger than a pheasant, with such exquisite art and perfection to present unto the king of Spain that it was prized to be worth in riches and workmanship half a million of ducats. There is in the cloister of the Dominicans a lamp hanging in the church with 300 branches wrought in silver to hold so many candles, beside a hundred little lamps for oil set in it, that every one being made with several workmanship so exquisitely that it is valued to be worth 400,000 ducats. And with such like curious works, there are many streets made more rich and beautiful from the shops of goldsmiths. Both men and women are excessive in their apparel, using more silks than stuff and cloth. Precious stones and pearls further much their vain ostentation. I told you he wasn't, he was a priest, he wasn't happy about this. A hat band and rose made of diamonds in a gentleman's hat is common, and a hat band of pearls is ordinary in a tradesman. Nay, a blackamoor or tawny young maid, and have will make hard shift, but she will be in fashion with her neck chain and bracelets of pearls and her ear bob of some considerable jewels. Thank you. And this Silver Way, by the way, this name is completely new. For the first time, it's used in, in a book to describe 
a trading route that was uh, uh, a catalyst of economic and cultural exchange. It was not a silk road. It was a silver way because silver was the most important uh, uh, commodity and also uh, the, the currency. But we are going to talk now about these parts of the cultural exchange, the book by Mendoza. This was the most important book, the first bestseller about China, written in Mexico by Mendoza, an Augustinian friar coming from La Rioja, who lived in Mexico, who finally died in Colombia as, uh, as a bishop. And this book became a bestseller in Europe and the first source of knowledge for the educated European uh, people and for more than 30 years. Published first in Rome, in Latin, in 1585, for 30, 40 years became uh, the only source of knowledge on China. And it was translated to the main European languages and still it was published for 100 years. Uh, it's a little bit amazing why it has been forgotten, but for the bibliophiles, uh, still you, you find it. And here, uh, the view of China will be very positive, as later we are going to say uh, uh, with, with some of these tracks. But it was based in the accounts because he didn't go to China. He finally was not allowed to go to China by the Spanish authorities. He, he wrote the book in Mexico. Uh, he was based in other earlier Portuguese and Spanish accounts. True, the Portuguese were the first Westerners to go to China in modern times, but their knowledge and their information was not translated. They published very little and never translated. The first Spanish embassy to China, to the province of Fujian, took place in 1575. This, led by a veteran Spanish soldier, Miguel de Luarca, and a Spanish uh, friar, also Augustinian friar, Martin de Rada. Also, uh, I would like also to highlight these figures, that they are the true catalyst between China and the West, and the first and um, unfortunately forgotten catalyst between China and the West, that were somehow pillars of uh, exchanges They were peaceful and constructive, with a willingness to learn from each other. This Martin de Rada, born in Pamplona, Navarra, had studied in the University of Paris, the most important European university at that time. Also studied in the University of Salamanca, the most important Spanish university, and then at the highest, at the highest of uh, his prestige. He was astronomer and mathematician. When he was uh, in Mexico, he he learned one of the most important uh, uh, languages, the most, the most difficult, not the most important, the most difficult languages, the Otomi language. And while well, he was in the Visayas in the Philippines, he learned the Visayas as well. So this kind of people, somehow we can build on them. And he is the first who made a discovery. And Peter can read this passage from the account of Martin de Rada. So this is from 1570. Uh, he names lots of uh, Chinese cities and people, but I don't know who they're referring to, so if you do, you can jump in and say. Um, all right. The country which we commonly call China was called by Marco Polo the Venetian the Kingdom of Cathay, perhaps because it was then so called. For when he came there, which was about the year 1312, it was ruled by the Tartars. The, natures, the native of these islands called China Sangle and the Chinese merchants themselves call it Tun Sua. However, its proper name nowadays is Taibin, which name was given it by the king Hombu, who drove the Tartars out of China. Just as, just as formerly at different times it had other names, such as Hanton, Tung Zhongguan, Tonggu, Kantai. Yes, this that uh, maybe for you is no surprise, is very important because for the first time, we understand that Marco Polo's Cathay and China are the same thing for the first time. So solving forever an old riddle. 
Marco Polo's book was the only source of information on China for the Europeans for uh, several centuries, but it was difficult uh, to understand the book and also to distinguish what it was, to distinguish fact from fancy. For the first time, a solid, really scientific knowledge, so to speak, on China appears through Spanish eyes and through Spanish language and translated to other languages. There were no the Jesuits, by the way. It was no Matteo Ricci, uh, several years later, who made this discovery. It's Martin de Rada, and it's written, and it's written in the account, finally, of Juan González de Mendoza. And these names that also are an, in, an intelligible, an intelligible to you, are no Mandarin, Putonghua, Huoyi, or Cantonese, are uh, Minanghua dialects. They met first uh, uh, Minanghua speaking people in Fujian. So these are the first names who appears uh, in these accounts. These are the names normally in Cantonese language or in Minanghua dialects that appears in the Western maps through Spanish information. And um, so this so I, is. Uh, so I continue. I'm not, this is yes. not finished. Uh, no, uh, I, I want Peter to read uh, something from Mendoza because, as I said, this meeting of uh, a Western power, the most important power in the world at this time, in the 16th, 17th centuries, meeting the Chinese, they meet as equal. So the account of Mendoza is, they highly regard uh, the Chinese civilization as mindful of its achievement, uh, mindful of, of its achievement, high in, in education. So it was a very, very positive and constructive view, as this uh, uh, reading right. can tell. Now this, this is a very old translation, so it's, it's the English is a bit, is a bit funny. He's, this chapter is called Of the Antiquity and Manner of Printing Books Used in This Kingdom Long Before the Use in Our Europe. The admirable invention and the subtle ingenie of printing is such that for the lack of use thereof should have been forgotten the worthiness of many excellent men and of their deeds done in happy days and times long past. Leaving apart the wonderful effects of this subtle invention, least speaking thereof I should be over tedious, I will here only go about to prove that which this chapter doth propound with some examples whereof many are found in their histories and likewise in ours. It doth plainly appear by vulgar opinion that the invention of printing did begin in Europe in the year 1458, the which was attributed unto a German called John Gutenburgo, or Johannes Gutenberg. But the Chinese do affirm that the first beginning was in their country, and that the inventor was a man whom they, they reverence for a saint, whereby it is evident that many years after that they had the use thereof, it was brought unto Germany by way of Russia and Moscow, from whence, as it is certain, they may come by land, and that some merchants that came from thence into this kingdom by the Red Sea and from Arabia Felix might bring some books, from whence this John Gutenburgo, whom the histories doth make the author, had his first foundation. The which being of a truth, as they have authority for the same, it doth plainly appear that this invention came from them unto us, and for the better credit thereof, as at, at this day there are found amongst them many books printed 500 years before the invention began in Germany, of the which I have one, and I have seen others, as well as in Spain and in Italy as in the Indies. The friar Errada and his companions, when they came from China unto the Filipinas, did bring with them many printed books of diverse matters, which they did buy in the city of Ancho, the, the which were printed in diverse places of the kingdom. Yet, as they did report, they would have bought a great number more if, not, if the viceroy had not disturbed them, for they have great libraries and very good cheap. But he suspected that those books might be a mean to give them to understand the secrets of their kingdom, the which they do endeavor to keep close from strangers. The viceroy used the police and sent them word how he was certified that they went about buying of books for to carry them into their country, and how they should not spend their money on them for he would give them for nothing so many books as they would have, which afterwards he did not perform, possible for the reason aforesaid, or else he did forget his promise. At such time as this commandment came unto them, they had bought a good number out of 
out of the which are taken the most things which we have put into our small history. He gives one, I'll read one example of the sorts of things he found in the books that he wrote about. There is no nation in the world, be it never so barbarous, that hath been found until this day without a manner of courtesy or some ceremony of salutation in their meetings and visitings, or when they do assemble in any particular business. Whereof we have large notice by ancient histories and sufficient experience in we have seen and understood in these kingdoms and provinces which in our days have been discovered. Although herein, as I am fully persuaded, those of this kingdom of China do exceed all the nations of the world, as is affirmed by them that have had the experience, for they have so many ceremonies and usages of courtesy and civility amongst them that they have books to teach them only how they should behave themselves in making difference of persons. They esteem it a great discourtesy not to salute one another when they see or meet one another, although the acquaintance betwixt them be but small. The salutation that the common people do use is when they do meet the, other with the, uh, do meet the one with the other is to shut the left hand and cover it with the right, joining therewith their breasts together with much bowing their heads downward, signifying that love and amity is firm between them as their hands are fast, and that their friendship is not al alone in the ceremony, but also in the heart, the which they do give to understand by words at the same time. But amongst courtiers and gentlemen, they use another manner of courtesy, which seemeth unto them of much more curiosity. That is, at such time as they do meet, they make a little stay, then they cast abroad their arms and clasp their fingers together, remaining in compass, humbling themselves many times, and contending one with another about their parting for to prosecute his way. And the higher estate they are, the more is their contention. This was not the only book that on, about China comes to the West. Antonio de Morga uh, in, wrote in the Philippines, Sucesos de las Islas Filipinas, or Events of the Philippines, but in reality is an account of all Southeast Asia, Cambodia, Vietnam, the Moluccas. Uh, in the information of this book written in 1609 and, and published in Mexico is so current, so to speak, that uh, you can read it today, you can profit from it. There is a fantastic translation by Cummins in, in the Hadfield uh, Society, perhaps out of print. There was also a fascinating report illustrated by the Chinese. We have seen before uh, one page. Uh, this is another page describing uh, the, the Tartars of the north of the north and the, what they call the Sanglais. The Sanglais is a word also uh, that comes from the Minahua to describe the Chinese themselves. And then it happens, uh, uh, well, this is in the collection now in the uh, Lilly Library in the uh, University of Indiana. It, it was in the collection of C.R. Boxer. If you want to learn a little bit more in English, C.R. Boxer is, has uh, fantastic books in English and also he wrote so beautifully out of print all these books, as all the good books. Then a relic, really a relic of this time, is the first translation from Chinese language to any to a European language, that it happens to be Spanish. And it was in Manila, not in mainland China when it happens. And it was a Confucian tract edited by Juan Cobo, a Dominican friar, and, and helped by his uh, assistants, by Chinese. And it was made in bootblock prints, that the, the print printing method that Mendoza uh, wrote about and Peter has been reading before, even though it, it was, uh, of course, the Latin alphabet, uh, so the Spanish language, the Castilian language, and, and the Chinese to, to have this. So also the first translation from is a European language, it happens to be Spanish to Chinese, happens at this time by the first, uh, by the same editor, by Juan Cobo in, 15, in the 1592, 1593. He died at sea, also Martin de Rada died at sea, unfortunately. How many of you know when this first translation happens? Or when the first Chinese characters appears in Europe? Also in another book written by the Spanish, there were several, Mar uh, Martin de Escalante, uh, Argensola, several other books uh, written in Spanish, uh, somehow serving as a catalyst of the knowledge of Asia to the world. And there are also other manifestations of these influences. Uh, 
of influence from the east. Uh, in particular, in, in the city of Puebla, a very important town in Mexico after Mexico City, and it was important also for making uh, ceramics. You know that in the West, they were not able to make uh, porcelain until the 18th century, so there was earthenware, but uh, covered now this thin glaze, but as you see, imitating the blue and white of China, but this is made in Puebla, in Mexico. Also, this image in ivory of the St. Magdalene, also made by Asian, uh, Filipinos, or Chinese uh, artisans, mainly in Manila. And some beautiful pieces, also this uh, to the left, uh, made in Puebla, also earthenware uh, with thin uh, glaze. And uh, you see, it has many influence, imitating the blue and white, but it has many influences. For those who love ceramics, uh, as I do, so it has Islamic influence that influence also there's the Spanish ceramics, although don't make mistakes, the, the Spanish uh, were making uh, ceramics before the Romans. So, uh, and obvious Chinese influence, even this is depicting, uh, depicting a Chinese scene of Chinese plain. No? And this a piece that I love, it's in the Museo de Artes Decorativas de Madrid, is what is called uh, jicara, that is the Nahuatl, the Mexican indigenous uh, word to describe the recipient to drink chocolate. Chocolate, of course, is an uh, American uh, beverage, but uh, the Spanish became crazy about it. At the beginning, the royalty and upper class, and in fact, it was a Spanish princess uh, marrying to Louis uh, XIII of France, who first uh, somehow uh, brought with her the custom of drinking chocolate to France and from France to the rest of Europe. So and the Spanish continue to love chocolate. But uh, this, uh, you, if you don't understand ceramics, you say, well, it's uh, one more cup. But those who understand know that it's a specific shape only produced at that, ta at that time by the Chinese in Jin De Chen, the imperial kilns. And this is through porcelain. It's a mm, Chinese landscape. It's blue and white, but also, uh, well, with esmalte, uh, uh, es in, in red, smart in red, and this bell shape uh, cup is only for this purpose and for this market. So to understand somehow made to order exports. And there are more influences. The Spanish were trading with the Japanese as well, and although we were the Chinese who invented the, these screens, uh, the Japanese took it to another level, and in Momoyama period are fantastic works of art, and they painted mainly in the screens. Then the Spanish, uh, and the Mexicans, or the Spanish-American, and the Latin-Americans, as we want to say, they continue to do the same. They painted in the screens, and they also imitate even the clouds and in gold, typical of Momoyama period in Japan, but uh, for this is representing uh, uh, well, near the, the Viceroy uh, Palace in, the, in Mexico City. And there were many, many screens painted. Uh, so if you like uh, well, Spanish art or Latin American art, you can read also Jonathan Brown explaining all the influence, the Asian influence in, in the Latin American art that were very, very important in the world. There was an exhibition in the Museum of Fine Art in Boston last, last year, Made in America. It's a fan, there's half a fantastic catalog, and I have it. Uh, please don't, don't miss it. It was something also a very unknown aspect, but very, very interesting. And now we go, uh, although we finish uh, now, we are finishing, to really uh, the protagonist or somehow the reason of uh, why all this happened, that it was silver. And... Uh, it was because the Europeans, not only the Spanish, when they met the Chinese, there was a, a high civilization uh, with a manufacturing prowess that, it, it w that in fact it becomes the factory of the world just at this time when the Spanish come and start to export and then the Dutch come and then the English come, but not for trade, but actually to try to seize the Manila Galleon. I can explain then in the questions but the, the, the Dutch never succeed, but the, the English just three, four times. And 
when the Chinese meet, uh, the Spanish meet the Chinese, they realize that they have nothing to provide to them. So the silks are fantastic silks and very cheap. The porcelain, even they cannot produce. Uh, nobody in Europe could match uh, China at this time that it was the wealthiest country on earth with the largest GDP, if you want to use these ugly words. But they realized that there is something they like, the Chinese like, silver. The Chinese that who invented the paper money had actually abandoned the paper uh, money very, very uh, soon by the, the end of the Yuan dynasty because of the high inflation. Then they realized the copper coins are of no use, particularly when the trade is becoming more sophisticated and largest. They uh, changed somehow the, the, the uh, into uh, the, the main currency of exchange and mainly to, to for the payment of taxes and to pay the civil serv servants, they decide to set in silver without realizing they didn't have uh, enough silver of their own. So, uh, in fact, the Portuguese came early trading with the Japanese they, because the Japanese, they have also silver and the Spanish came at the very right time. Also because they have found a uh, great supply of silver in two important places, but mainly in Potosí, which is in today's Bolivia, in the past, in the vice royalty of Peru, that it was a mountain full of silver, and also Zacatecas in, in New Spain, Mexico, but mainly Potosí, and also develop a way of extraction of very economical and quickly uh, way of extraction with mercury that they found in Huancabelica, very close to Potosí, and unfortunately, also with uh, exploitation of human beings. And this silver was at the beginning trade in, in ingots, so uh, by, by weight, or even by rudimentary coins that were valued just by weight. But there was a progress, in fact, from the, uh, what is called Reyes Catolicos or Catholic Kings by the end 15th century, all the Spanish monarch, the, the Spanish uh, monarchy, the Spanish kings, were very keen and tried to maintain the standards of weight and, and shape and, and, and also all the administrative rules that come with it, with, with the currency, with, uh, and also including human resources. And they took uh, advantage of every technology that could improve. So you see somehow a development of these rudimentary uh, coins actually mint in Mexico, they were mint in Spain, of course, but the, the main mints were in Mexico, particularly for the uh, Chinese market. It was in the 1730s that finally strike a fantastic coin, so to speak, with some developments, no? some uh, these uh, serrated uh, edges and very high quality of the printing and always keeping the same weight and standards. And this was called uh, Real de Aocho, or Pieces of Eight, as we have uh, read, as we have uh, listened to Peter before. And uh, it was in English, uh, the Spanish dollar, also Mexican dollar. In fact, although this trade that started in 1565 with the discovery of Urdaneta, or if you want to be more specific or more rigorous, from 1571, since Manila, the city of Manila is founded, uh, it finished in 1815, uh, uh, because of the war of independence from, of Mexico from the crown of Spain. But uh, still, uh, coins mint in Mexico were very valuable in China even to the early 20th century. This is better known, at least for the people uh, specialized in, in monetary history, which are always very messy and very difficult for the policies of all the governments around the world. These uh, Spanish coins will be the base or the foundation of the most important coins in the world. So it starts somehow the, uh, well, it's the first international trade, the first uh, uh, marks of globalization that Peter will explain now. And some of, uh, someone can identify this one, for example, the one in the center. It's a little bit, unfortunately, not very good at printing. So someone can tell is the first Hong Kong dollar, the British, that by the way came uh, somehow 
provoke, so to speak, the opium wars is because of the lack of silver. So this is, uh, they didn't have silver of their own. Uh, but they didn't set on the pound. They set uh, somehow following the, the Spanish dollar, they set the Hong Kong dollar. The, the, the one to the left, upper left, which coin is that one? United States dollar, so it's based on the Spanish dollar. In fact, the, the symbol of the two bars are the columns of Hercules, the symbol of Spain as well. And uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, in French Indochine, and then uh, China and Japan as well. So even Yuan, so uh, it means round. So I uh, finish here, uh, and Peter is going to speak a little bit the, the keys of globalization. Thank you very much. So we we call this the birth of globalization, and let me see if I can if I can prove it to you. Uh, with Urdaneta's finding the route back from Manila to Acapulco, the trade started within 10 years. There were regular sailings. This was the first time that all of the oceans could be crossed in both directions, that trade could cross all the main trade routes in two directions. So it was really the first time that human activity was global in scale, all right? So whatever may have happened before that, whatever sorts of internationalization or transcontinental trade or other activities there may have been, it wasn't global because it didn't include the Americas. So almost by definition, it couldn't have happened before that. And so 1565 or 1573, when the first commercial ship went, um, these were the first time that human economic activities took on a global scale. The Manila Galleon is recognizable as a shipping line. It had regular shippings, it had bills of lading, it had invoices. Uh, it was like P&O, except it lasted for longer than P&O did. It lasted for 250 years. So it was really the first shipping line and the most venerable, the one that lasted a long time. The next thing we have is the integration of the world's financial markets through the medium, through a financial medium, in this case, silver. Um, things that happened in Latin America, increases in silver, decreases in silver, would affect what happened in other parts of the world. There were three of these ships from Mexico to the Philippines that went down in short order at the beginning of the 17th century. They sank. Uh, the Ming Dynasty fell 10 years later. Now, you have to be careful about the causality but there certainly seems to have been a monetary shock in China at that time, a restriction in the money supply. People couldn't pay their taxes because there was no coins with which to pay them. Something else that happened is that there was what we would now call currency rate arbitrage. That is, the price of gold in China relative to silver was much, much less than it was in Europe. That is, the exchange rates between the two. And so what you would expect to happen happened. Silver went into China, gold went out of China until around 1640 the exchange rate stabilized and this stopped. Then we have uh, the first world city, which was Mexico City, something in Hong Kong we know all about. Well, there was one 400 years ago, uh, a place where people from all the four continents met. They traded, I say that we traded genes of both the textile variety and the other variety. Um, and then in 1730s, we have what could really be called the first global currency, which was the, we call it the Spanish milled dollar. These were made in machines, and they had a serrated edge. What used to happen before that is you saw the irregularly shaped coin, people could cut the edges. So they got smaller and smaller and smaller as people chipped little bits of silver off and then used it for other coins. You couldn't do that with these because effectively they had anti-fraud devices, okay? These had anti-counterfeit, anti-fraud devices. So not only were they of a very high standard, uh, but people couldn't counterfeit them. This coin really became accepted all around the world. Not in every part of the world, but in all the continents of the world, you could take these coins and use them. Uh, and you will see them with Chinese assay marks on them where merchants would chop them to see what they were. Um, the coin was so useful out here that when the Spanish stopped minting them after Mexican independence, uh, China and the people out here went to Mexico and said, please mint more coins, we need them. And in the middle of the 19th century, 
the Mexicans began to mint, as you see, the eagle dollars, which again became currency. You know, when I came to Hong Kong lo longer ago than I care to admit, you could still find these coins sort of in the markets. They would fake them too, of course. You know, go to Temple Street and buy fake Mexican dollars, but they were known in Hong Kong. Uh, you can go to see old Hong Kong bank ledgers and they list things in Mexican dollars. So this really was the first global currency. It was legal tender in the United States until the mid-1800s. Uh, 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 the silver dollar is the same coin. The yuan is the same coin. The yen is the same coin. The Hong Kong dollar is the same coin. So for all of those reasons, we consider this to be the beginnings of globalization. Now, before we go to questions, I'll leave you with one last thought, and that is, this sure sounds like the Silk Road, just pointed in the other direction, right? And that was, in some way, the genesis of the book, when <laughs> uh, Juan and I were uh, looking at this, and, I, and we said, boy, this is really the Silk Road, but just rather than going towards Central Asia, it was pointed the other direction. And in fact, it really was the successor to the Silk Road. You know, people debate when the Silk Road really ended, but it really ended in the 15th century, that with the collapse of the Mongol Empire, so people could no longer cross uh, over land, and then finally with the fall of Constantinople in 1453, which closed down uh, Venetian accent, uh, access to, to, uh, to the Middle East, the spice markets in Europe finished. And that was really the time when both the Portuguese and the Spanish started sending ships out to try to find a route to Asia because they, what they wanted was pepper. The pepper trade had been cut off. Pepper was very valuable, and that's what they wanted. And so not only is it historically a successor to the Silk Road, it really is the successor to the Silk Road. So the relevance of this today uh, is that, as you know, the Silk Road, through the magic of geopolitics, has morphed into the new Silk Road and now One Belt, One Road. Um, it is a way for China to organize its relationships with the countries uh, in this part of the world. But the same idea, we don't, won't call it the Silk Road, we'll call it the Silver Way, or La Ruta de la Plata in Spanish, can be a way to do exactly the same thing with the Americas. Uh, so that when China goes to Latin America, as it is, it's very active there, as you may know. It's not starting from zero. It's building on a set of historical relationships that lasted for 250 years, a very long time. And so that's why all of this, we think, becomes important for the present day. Uh, thank you for the nice presentation, first of all. Um, I want to ask you, what was the value of the dollar? What you can buy with one dollar at that time, Mexican dollar, or to have a, a reference? Or how much, how much well, appreciated was the, the, the chocolate? Well, purchasing power parities are really difficult over that period of time, but I think, I think there's some uh, some ideas in the figures I gave you. That is, a merchant on a single voyage could profit between fifteen and 20,000 of these silver dollars. And that would be enough to set him up for life. So you could do that once and you'd have enough to live on for the rest of your life. So what does that mean in today's money? Half a million U.S. dollars, a million U.S. dollars, maybe enough if you invested properly. So that would, that would give you some idea. Also, Mm, yes, so you, you you know, I have said how big there were these ships, so at least 500 tons by even 1,000 tons, 2,000 tons. And the, of course, the, the, the world economy at that time was also small. But it was a very risky business to, to travel in this way and to cross the Pacific. But the profit margins were huge. So uh, it was, why it was limited to only one ship? So the Spanish monarchy, they said, uh, they were afraid that too much silver could go out of America instead of going to Europe or to the, the Spanish monarchy in Europe. And also they tried to protect the, uh, the manufacturers in, in America and even in Europe because the silk from China was of excellent superior quality and however very cheap. The same in the, with the porcelain. 
It was so cheap that it was somehow in Spain disregard. It is true that it was in the, in the hands of the royalty or, the, or the, the aristocracy, but it was like a minor item. So this, I think, is, is important to give an idea. So these profit margins and these, these the economics of behind this trading route. And you could buy a lot with a dollar, but it was 50 times of what you could buy today, 100, those kinds of numbers. Mm -hmm. There's another, uh, this, this, this Italian guy, uh, when he was writing uh, about Acapulco, one of the stories was, was about a priest uh, who used to bury people who died at sea. And because he was the only priest in town, he could charge a lot of money. Okay? And so Carreri rather um, unflatteringly said he made 8,000 pieces of eight a year by burying the sailors who had died at sea. And he was considered rich. That was a lot of money at the time. You know, he wasn't a millionaire. So uh, does that give you some idea? Like that. <laughs> some more questions? Yeah, Beatrice. Yeah. <coughs> thank you very much. So uh, again, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. As, as you know, this must be the, 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 the fourth time that uh, myself and the Consul General <laughs> of Mexico have been <laughs> attending uh, one presentation of uh, uh, related to this book and every time there's a new aspect that has been discovered to me and it's always uh, very interesting. This time uh, the wealth of primary sources that you have presented have been quite quite interesting, it, uh, especially uh, the part um, when you point out the, uh, the cultural um, um, yes, the, the, the exchange of uh, the, 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 the pottery, the ceramics, I mean, that reflects the, the trade and the influence of Asia in, 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 in Latin America uh, culture. In, uh, in Mexico, the, the National Museum of the, of the Vice Royalty in Tepozotlan uh, shows a very wide collection precisely reflecting this, uh, this trade. But my, uh, what I wanted to ask you precisely on the primary sources, I was wondering, uh, if there was a, 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 a young researcher if, uh, that would, would like to, to go further on this, on, on this subject, where is the, 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 the wealth of, uh, I mean, is there a, a, a library, is there a place where he uh, can uh, do further research? Because I think since there are so many countries related in this, uh, this exchange, so many actors. I, I, I guess the, the information is still scattered, but I, uh, since in no way I'm an expert, I don't know if there's a place where you could refer to. Yeah, uh, well, it's, uh, actually what, what is uh, somehow ironic is that this is completely unknown or forgotten, but the sources are very easy to, to reach. So they are, uh, uh, the primary sources are very well kept in the uh, Mexican and Spanish archives. And, and also they have been somehow updated and translated into English by a great, uh, I mean, when the Americans, uh, or North Americans, the United States, won the war against the Spanish in 1898 and took over Cuba, the, late, the latest, uh, uh, territories that Cuba, Puerto Rico, and Philippines. Uh, there were some um, uh, US scholars also that made a huge compilation of all the sources and is in English. And now even is available in the internet. So uh, this is why our book is mainly written in the first person. So uh, is taking mainly primary sources and let them speak. And it's a very good question because it is really, this is the fantastic reality. In 1904 to 19 something, 1912, was published a 55 volume set of translations of all the documents from the Archivo de las, de las Indias related to the Philippines. The whole lot, everything. And it's 55 volumes long and it's in English and not all the volumes are on Gutenberg.org something like 40 out of the 55 are there. Um, it's more, more stuff than you can read in a long time. Yes. Um, what was interesting though, is that as Juan and I were doing some of this, there were some things that we weren't, the translations looked funny. And we knew the citation in English, 
and we had to find the original Spanish document. All right? And they're all actually, th they're all on the internet too, but you have to try to recreate the original Spanish uh, words in order to find it because we all, because all, most of this is documented in English. There's this marvelous, line, marvelous letter uh, that was written after Urdaneta made it back to Acapulco in 1565. There was a letter written in Sev to somebody in Seville in 1566, the next year, talking about this, saying that the Mexicans are so proud of this that they are sure that they will become the center of the world. Which is how we lead the book. It's a nice, nice line. And so this happened within one year, I mean, very, very quickly, really. But the point was, is that we needed the original Spanish. The English is all over the place. It's cited all over the place. And we had, it took us quite a while to find the original Spanish wording for it because it's always in translation. We did find it in the end. We sort of had to guess, and we did, we did find it. But, you know, much of this is online. I think most of the Archivo de las Indias is online, too, now. You just have to know how to find it. A lot of the okay, primary you sources. Have, you have to find it, you have to ask, and you have to pay sometimes. <laughs> a little bit. Uh, the internet is a marvel. The, you know, these, these books that I was quoting from, the original books are there. I mean, the 1648 version of Thomas Davies' book is online. There's this other uh, Mexican poet, La Buena, from the mid 17th century, I think it was, who talks about all the things that you can buy in Mexico City. And he says, all the best of Europe and Asia is combined in Mexico, he writes. And again, it's quoted by everybody who writes on the subject. The original copies of that book are available on the internet. But oh. with, all, with all, you know, the S's written as F's and things like that. They're very hard to read. But, but yes, they're all there. Yes, I think you wanted to ask a question. Uh, good evening. Uh, I actually have two questions. Uh, the first one is about, uh, for I'm doing the uh, history of uh, similar periods, I am very would be very interested to know uh, if you can f identify other Asians, like the Japanese before the uh, 16th century, in this kind of trade between the Europeans and, and the Asians. For uh, You have mentioned about the Chinese, but uh, I know that uh, there should be a, lo a larger population of Japanese uh, before the Tokugawa Bakufu. Uh, in that era, particularly Manila. And the second question is about the uh, motive of the R Europeans traveling. Besides trading, there should be like a religious uh, uh, motives. And in the later ages, like in the uh, British I Indian Company, they, they have a conflict between the merchants and the missionaries that they, they have different uh, understanding of what they are doing. So is that uh, all phenomenon also happening in your cases? Uh, yes, well, the, the first question, it is uh, true that um, to Manila they came also uh, Japanese. So Japanese before, Japan before the 1640 was uh, what CR Boxer called the Christian century. So the number of converts to the Catholic religion was very huge. There were thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. Uh, this was uh, this threatened uh, somehow the status quo and the, the, the power and the, ec the economy of the country and, and finally the Tokugawa closed very cruelly as well. And they closed and they, in a point that they erase every trace of that, that culture. So we cannot say that the Japanese, so we know little about the, the Japanese at, at this time. They really erase any trace of Christianity. Uh, there were the first embassy of uh, uh, the Japanese to, to Europe, and also to see the pop. It was made through M Manila, Mexico, and then Spain, Rome. And as we have seen, there were influence in the goods. So this biombo, that is a kind of Portuguese word that comes from the Japanese, biobo, to cut the wind. Uh, yes, there were many, and also there were trading goods from the Philippines. For example, I have some photos of some ceramics, earthenware made in the Philippines that they liked it for the Japanese ceremony. Yes, there were. And there were also Indians. 
people from the Moluccas, uh, so there were other Asians, and in, in Mexico there are also Indians, so not only uh, Chinese. And well, to the other question, it is true, so we, uh, uh, I will summarize the, the importance of religion. Uh, I will summarize in, in the words of uh, Vasco da Gama, when Vasco da Gama land in Calicut, um, so the first European so to, speak, come to Asia, he met Arab traders, and they speak to him in Spanish, lingua franca, in the Mediterranean. And they tell him, uh, ¿Qué demonios vienes a hacer aquí? What the hell are you doing here? And he, Vasco da Gama replies in Spanish, Venimos por Dios y por especias. We come for God and for trade for spices, for God and for spices. It, uh, as we have seen, so all these catalysts between China and the West are mainly priests, so the highly educated people are priests, and they try, yes, they have a mission. And the, somehow, well, why these stories and how exchanges also fail, so to speak, is because of religion. Because even though the trade work, for example, with Japan, the the uh, somehow the shogunate the shoguns were uh, happy with the money they were making and the Chinese were happy with the money what they were making they were more afraid of the influence of religion to the point that in Japan they closed for centuries the country in 1614 and to the point that in China with the conflicts of uh, the rights controversy also well they they put uh, in a high uh, control. Uh, the, the, the influence of the Europeans, and particularly these friars, what uh, the Augustinians, Dominicans, Franciscans, uh, inst instead of the Jesuits, but finally is um, really very little religious influence they can have. Uh, well, it is a very important topic. Uh, I love it as well. We can talk later, we can exchange. Yeah. Yes, uh, Rodrigo from the Philippines. Uh, how much time we have? Um, I just wanted to add, um, relevant to the question, uh, because um, I met um, a historian, Filipino historian from University of Santo Tomas, who was doing similar uh, research about Japanese in the Philippines. And uh, he said something like, by the time the um, Legaspi expedition arrived in Manila, they had actually met the first Catholics there before they arrived, they were Catholics, obviously, right? But the first Catholics in the Philippines were not the Spanish, they were actually Japanese. And they were Japanese um, converted into um, Christianity, uh, and they were trained uh, specifically in Macau uh, by Saint, well, believed uh, by Saint Francis Xavier, or at least the acolytes uh, or disciples of Saint Francis Xavier. So um, even before uh, Manila was established as a city in 1572 by uh, the Legaspi, expedition, uh, they had already Japanese there. And then um, past um, the Toyotomi era, um, when they started uh, exp expelling people from, um, Christians from Japan, in fact, there was a upsurge of um, uh, enrollment in the universities founded by the Spanish in Manila, in particular Lyceum, um, um, I think, Let so San Juan de Letran because they have Universidad de Santo Tomas and San Juan de Letran were the two, I think 1612 and 1614 established in Manila. And they actually had a lot of Japanese um, children of the daimyo who were being sent. So by the 1830s, 1834, if you look at the role, uh, enrollment rolls of the people there, you actually find a lot of Japanese last names, but highly Christianized or Catholic, Catholic uh, because they're named after saints. and. They usually ha were baptized, so they would have um, Spanish, like Dom um, Domingo or like, you know, uh, Lazaro or, you know, but they would have Japanese last name. So you can see even before they closed Japan in 1640, they already were sending their children. Uh, perhaps they sensed that they would be it would the space that they were operating would eventually close. Um, so anyway, just to add to, to that particular. Thank you so much. Very, very interesting information. First of all, congratulations, because it's really a very okay. entertaining book. I really, really liked it. And it's a, it's a voyage of discovery or maybe rediscovery, because you mentioned many things that are 
uh, forgotten. And that brings me to my question, wh when did you decide or how did you decide to write this book and how much investigation or rediscovery went into it? Because it seems that it's pretty much about rediscovery, yes? Well, I, I have been uh, learning about this or, or part of this since I was born. So I, I was born in Spain when the stones speak and you learn from them. And, and then all this age of discovery and exploration. It was when I, I came to Hong Kong, so 21 years ago, that I took it more seriously. So I also have been doing many, many things, organizing international seminars, writing other things that they didn't have a, any echo at all. So it was meeting my, my friends, Peter, <laughs> Peter Gordon, that finally gave it a, a complete twist and reinterpreted uh, everything and we went very fast and it was very funny and it was uh, I, I think yes I already discovered it also from actually I was like angry and bored at the, at the topic because uh, I, I, I was going nowhere I have a large library I have I know uh, everybody in the field but I it came to nowhere until Peter knew how to explain it. school you in, in a Spanish-speaking country and you learn these things you know so um, the for me the realization this was all happening as the new Silk Road was being developed and it was becoming you know one belt one road here it's in, you know 2015 and Juan had been reviewing some other books on this general subject on the subject of you know, the early European, early modern European presence uh, in, uh, in Asia and some discussion about uh, the Manila Galleon. And all of a sudden it dawned on me, the name popped into my head. The La Ruta de la Plata, not the Silk Road, but the Silver Way. And I think that was really the genesis of it. And for me it was partly the history, but it was also partly seeing how the history could inform the present. And I think that was perhaps the missing piece, was, th was that this is not done and dusted and dry stuff for the history books. This is actually of considerable relevance to what is happening uh, in the world today. And that may be the slight difference between this book and the way we've positioned it and some of what's happened before. It's not just history, it's actually living and alive and still happening. And I think they're waving at us to stop. Yeah? yeah?